big welcome along to everybody today. It's great to have you here with us. And um, my name is Claire and I'm the Green Schools Biodiversity Officer. Um, and we're delighted to have you here as part of Biodiversity Week. Um, so Green Schools are really pleased to be celebrating, um, especially this year, which is the 25th um, anniversary. And um, so throughout this session, we would ask that you um, keep your microphones turned off. Um, but you can um, ask and answer any questions you like in the chat box. So we will have a QA and a um, at the end of today's um, sessions. But if any questions occur to you as we go along, you can pop them there and, and we'll ask them at the end. Um, we are looking out for particularly good questions um, or good answers if there are any um, throughout. And there will be spot prizes um, throughout the week. Um, so do get your, your fingers ready on your laptops to ask any, any questions that occur to you. Um, so today's, um, today's session is on biodiversity in Ireland, um, and we've got two brilliant speakers with us. Um, so we're going to start off in a minute um, with Ricky Whelan. So Ricky is um, the biodiversity officer in Offaly County Council. And Ricky's going to be talking to us about swifts in Ireland. So they're a really interesting bird. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. And um, so Ricky will be telling us all about them. Um, and after um, Ricky's talk, we will have um, Hannah Kindregan. And Hannah is um, a climate ambassador with Antashka this year. Um, and she's also working as a community development officer um, with Ballyhura Development. And Hannah's going to talk all about um, all of the great things that nature and particularly trees can do um, to help us to prevent the effects of climate change. So we've got two really interesting talks coming up. Um, and like I said, don't be afraid to um, ask questions at the end. So um, I'm going to hand over to um, Ricky now um, to, to kick us off. So over to you there, Ricky, if you want to share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Thanks, there for the introduction and uh, the invite to give a talk about a very important species. And I'm going to make this uh, as quick as I can. And Claire, you might just, um, you might give me a five minute uh, warning if I'm getting um, too, uh, too close to, to the end. Um, that will be good. I'm just going to stop my video as well. So my, my, my connection is a bit more stable. Okay. So swift Great. conservation and um, with me, uh, Ricky Whelan. So I'm currently the biodiversity officer with Offaly County Council, but for the last 15 years previous to this job, uh, I was a bird conservationist. And so all my work in life, I've, I've tried to protect and conserve wild birds uh, in Ireland and elsewhere. And um, because birds aren't uh, doing very good uh, in many respects, and many species are suffering declines. So their, their populations are dropping because of effects of um, mostly that humans have caused, but, um, including climate change and pollution and habitat loss and all sorts of stuff. So um, Swiss are, are no different, unfortunately. I'm going to talk about them in detail this morning. So the swift is a, a small uh, migratory bird that migrates to Ireland and Europe and, uh, and all across the, the, the sort of um, the globe almost uh, to uh, each from, from, from Africa every summer. And it breeds here in our villages and our towns. Uh, and it's got a unique um, ecology in, in many ways, but it's about the size of a swallow or, or a starling. It's a bit smaller than a starling, which people will be familiar with. And really it's the shape and the color is, is, is the real giveaway. They've got these sickle shaped wings, uh, very long and slender and adapted to be uh, almost in constant flight. And they've got a shallow forked tail and the, when you look at them silhouetted against the summer sky, they look nearly completely jet black. But in, in reality, they're actually this kind of slate gray color. Uh, and and they're, 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 you know, they're not sort of very flamboyant in their color, um, but they're, they're, they have a lot of charisma uh, in the way they fly uh, and how they communicate with each other and all that. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So they have a unique um, ecology uh, in, in many ways. They, 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 this is an adult bird here and he's, she's carrying back a bolus of food to her chicks uh, which are in the nest somewhere and the bolus you can see it almost looks like she's another a big swelling under her beak and that's made up of hundreds if not thousands of insects that she's after catching uh, in flight she's hawking in flight she doesn't she doesn't sort of pick worms from the ground or from the trees or bugs from the trees or 
the vegetation or anything like that. The swifts catch all of their food uh, in flight, and we say on the wing. And then she comes back to the chicks, normally two little chicks, sometimes three in, 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 in the nest, and dumps the bolus with them. And then they digest that for a number of hours over the day. And that's that's strange because a lot of other birds normally bring back two or three little morsels of food every nearly every couple of seconds. So if you're watching the garden robin or a blue tit going to a nest box in your in your school grounds or at home, uh, you might notice that they're coming back every couple of minutes with caterpillars and uh, little bugs and stuff for the hungry chicks. But what swifts do is they have a different uh, technique. They go off for hours at a time and they hoover up these insects over sort of freshwater bodies like rivers and large lakes. And the guys up in Monaghan and Cavan uh, would be familiar with that. And even in Mead, uh, where there's a lot of those big open freshwater places. And they're perfect um, sort of places for swifts to forage. And if you go there on a summer's evening, if you go there this evening, you'll see swifts foraging over those lakes and rivers. Uh, and it's really good. So that's what they do. They have a different technique than, than coming back every, every couple of minutes. So that's a bolus up close, quite gross, but you can see all the insects' eyes in there, all the compound eyes of the hoverflies that that's mostly made up of. And that looks huge now, but it's about the size of, uh, I suppose, um, uh, a, a, a small kind uh, or, or, or maybe a, a thumbnail, uh, something like that. So that's the size you're looking at. And there's hundreds and sometimes thousands of little midges and mosquitoes and everything uh, crammed into those, but full of protein for the chicks. So swifts uh, really are amazing because they do everything on the wing. So once the chicks fledge from their nest site, uh, they, they, they stay in constant flight for a number of years. And I, I don't mean I, they don't land for a rest. They stay flying. So they drink on the wing, they mate on the wing, and they even sleep on the wing. They go into autopilot. They can switch off one side of their brain. They go above all the sort of weather and all that sort of stuff that can affect them. And they go around and around up in the sort of darkness of the night sky. And in the morning when the light comes back, they return sort of back down to uh, nearer the sort of ground. And that's where they feed again. So unless they're at their nest site, the only time swifts uh, bother landing is to nest and lay their eggs and rear their young. So they can, some scientists say they can be in constant flight for up to three years. And their body is adapted. They have small, little, short legs, not very good. If they end up on the ground, they find it very hard to, to fly again, uh, to sort of launch themselves, uh, because their legs and their feet are very strong, but are adapted to cling to vertical surfaces, to walls. And we'll get to why that's important in a minute. But when they end up on the ground, it's, 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 it's not fatal, but it can be sort of tricky for them to get, get, get up and, and, and running again. So they really are amazing. They do everything in flight. And even they, they, they build, uh, what they build their nest with is just a tiny little clump of feathers and, and, and bits and pieces uh, like cobwebs and anything they can find in the air column uh, because they don't sort of don't land in a field and pick grass or whatever moss that other birds might. Uh, they, they, they really are unique in that sense. So, um, we do confuse them with other species because they are quite similar. So you can see there the swift is the top left picture. You can see those that silhouette of the, the sickle shaped wings. It looks nearly completely black, like I said, and that shallow forked tail. So um, that's normally the giveaway the shape and, and, and the sort of speed of their flight. Then we have the martins. There's two different uh, we have. Uh, actually, I'll go straight to swallow. Um, the swallow here, people will be familiar with, probably the most familiar of, of the, the species that we confuse them with. Uh, in that it's got the it, it, it's similar size, but it's got a long forked tail. You see the males of this swallow have these long forked streamers and that's uh, the males have the longest streamers. And they've got this big white belly and they've got a red chin and these white marks under the wing as well. And they're the guys you see nesting in your turf shed and tool shed and lean to and, and, and maybe in the bike, the bike shed at school or wherever. And they nest in these uh, little half cup nests made up of little pellets of mud. Uh, and we're, they're probably the most familiar species to us. And you see them perching on uh, power lines and, 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 and stuff like that. Um, but you never see a swift. So the rule of thumb is if you see the bird perching, it's not a swift because they just don't land like that. And these two guys at the bottom is, is, is the house martin and the sand martin. They're very closely related, but they're kind of similar to swifts in that they've got this little forked tail as well. They're mostly black, uh, but you can tell the difference. The, the, the house martin has this big white rump patch, that white patch above its tail, and it's got a white patch below its chin as well. And they're the guys that nest in the, in sort of under the eaves of the roof. You might see them in the corner of the gable of your house. Uh, or your grandparents or even at the school and they come sometimes they nest in big long rows to be lots like almost like an apartment block of of of, of house martin nests uh, and then and sand martins are so called because they nest in in sand cliffs and in quarries and along rivers and stuff like that and even in peat bogs they can in the face of the turf bank they can they can burrow in there so they're sand martins so 
they're vaguely similar. And then the nest sites they choose can give away what their identity as well. So the swift always nests in buildings, almost exclusively in buildings they've adapted, nest especially in old buildings. And what they need is a little cavity, a little space to go in, safe from the weather, safe from predators, and they lay their eggs in a little sort of a little tiny nest, just enough of a nest to stop the eggs rolling out, really. So you see that swift down the bottom left, and he's emerging from out under a roof tile. So that's very, very um, normal place to find um, swifts. And um, then the, 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 the swallow, as I mentioned, has that half cup nest. And it's a good rule of thumb. If you can see the nest, it's not a swift because they're always away, tucked away in a, a little uh, gap or niche in a building where the cement has fallen out or where they can gain access to under a roof tile or whatever. And we'll get to that uh, more. And then the, 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 the swallow, as I said, has that half cup nest made of mud in the turf shed. And, and you often hear the chicks. And they'll have a couple of broods. They'll have two or three broods. And you can see them coming and going from the turf shed all summer long. Then the house martins are the guys that are along the, the row underneath the, 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 the roof uh, on the wall. And their nest is nearly a full cup where they just leave a little gap to come and go and for the chicks to eventually pop out of uh, for the parents to feed them. So and that's quite normal. And then the sand martins are found in, in sand pits and along rivers and all that sort of stuff. So there are confusion species. And when the four species are all whizzing around at sort of 80 miles an hour in the summer sky, they can be very, very difficult to separate. So the swift seasonal distribution is um, very, so you can see this big yellow blob. So you can see Ireland over here to the west uh, and Britain uh, just there. And then but they breed all across here, all the way over into Asia, uh, northern Russia, into, um, into um, uh, you know, right across Eastern Europe and down as far as North Africa. But they winter where this blue blob is, below in sub-Saharan Africa, we call it in our birds. We know from tracking them from satellite tags and different things. They go down to the Congo Basin, which is down here, right at the bottom, sort of towards the bottom of, of, of Africa. And there they follow this, the rains. And the rains come to Africa and there's, a, there's floods and there's just a profusion of growth, but there's also a profusion of insects. And then they, they, they just hoover up those insects all winter long down in Africa, it gets them in good condition to breed before they return a huge migratory of four and a half thousand kilometers back up to Ireland to trim or to Navin or to Cavan or wherever they're going to nest that summer. So they need to be in really good condition, but Africa provides them all the food and sustenance they need. And they still haven't landed. They've migrated all the way back down to Africa for the winter, fed on all those insects and then all the way back up to Ireland to breed. So they're really, really amazing. Um, you know, and, and, and then they get up here and it's summertime, so there's lots of insects for them here. So it works. It's a good cycle for them. So this is a very typical swift nest. It's in an old wall. This is Burr Castle in Offaly. Um, and the, 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 the wall is there hundreds and hundreds of years. And the, 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 the mortar has fallen out. The cement, if you like, has fallen out between the, the stones. And you can see where the swift is coming out there. He's emerging. He's just after feeding these chicks and he's on his way back out to launch into the air and go feeding uh, uh, again for the day. So they're, 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 they nest semi-colonially. So that means they like to be around other swifts. So they almost, they, they nest in kind of apartment blocks, if you like. If they can find a number of gaps in crevices, um, uh, you know, amongst their friends, if you like, they'll happily do that. So where you get one swift, you can often find uh, lots of swifts. And some of the, the really big colonies can be 40, 50, 60 uh, pairs nesting there. So they can be very, very important sites. So you see in this background picture, there's a swift under the pipe here. Uh, there's another one just dropped out of this gap here. And there's another one going up here uh, to, to in a nest site there. And that's in a, in a town called Bannerher in, 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 in West Offaly, very on the Shannon uh, River. So that's perfect, that town for them, because they have lots of old buildings to nest in. And then they just they just fly to the to the river where there are piles of insects feed, uh, hatching from the river. Uh, and, and they just feed on those and, and they have a very good time. So but the problem is that, that, that one of the, their ecological requirements is they're, they're site faithful. So they go back to the very same crack or crevice that they've nested in the year before for as long as they live and as long as they breed. So if you come along with your uh, bag of cement or your expanding foam or uh, whatever it might be and block that hole, they've lost that site for them. And it's very, very problematic for them to find new sites. So it's really important that we protect the sites that they uh, exist in and big colonies. So what can happen is Overnight, there could be 40 nests in, a, in an old roof, in a convent or a church or an old castle. And then someone will come along doing the right thing to conserve the building and look after the building and restore it. Uh, but they don't realize there's swifts inside and they can actually destroy a whole colony overnight. So they're really, really under pressure. And it's, it's, it's important that we protect those sites and also provide new sites. But we'll get to that as we go along. So 
unfortunately, it's bad news for the Swift. So I won't go bore you too much with with, with maps and things. But um, in the last twenty years, we know that there's been a sixty, almost a sixty percent decline. So more than half the Swifts that existed 20 years ago no longer exist. They're really, really in bad shape. Uh, and unless we try to conserve them and we, we create space for them and nesting sites and we get a handle on things and we, uh, you know, they've been off to eat and we just protect their environment, um, they're, they're really going to suffer badly and potentially go extinct in, 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 in Ireland and, and, and further sort of uh, east into UK and, and, and all across Europe. So we really, really need to look after our Swifts. So they're red listed in Ireland. So that means that they're of the most critical concern to bird conservationists in this country. So uh, this is the red list here. And unfortunately, they share that list with lots of species. So not just the swift that's under pressure. You might have heard that the curlew are almost gone extinct in this country. Hen harriers, which are a beautiful bird of prey, are in trouble. The corn crakes are nearly a, a, a bird that your, 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 your great grandparents and your grandparents potentially remember, but you won't remember because they, they, they've disappeared across the Irish countryside in time because, uh, you know, lots of conservation issues tackling them and, 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 and we're, we're chasing our tails on them. We're trying to save that species, but they could go extinct uh, before in, in your lifetime, which is which is frightening. So what happens? So lots of reasons. So one of the main reasons for their decline is their loss of nest sites. So you see a couple of pictures here. Top left is a new apartment block somewhere in, in some city in, in Ireland, Dublin, perhaps Cork. I don't know. Modern buildings don't suit swifts because, I, as I said, they, they nest in cracks and crevices and little opportunity when they get opportunities like that. But with new buildings are so well designed, so well um, kept and, and the materials and the design just don't allow those gaps for swifts anymore. So we're building them out of our new buildings, be it our new homes, be it our new schools, be it our apartment blocks, whatever it might be. There's just no space for swifts anymore. Second picture on the top right is two uh, carpenters stripping a roof of an old building, doing the right thing, trying to renovate the building and look after it. But they've stripped the roof of with, where there is nesting swifts. And it's unknown to them, so they haven't broken any laws. Uh, they haven't really done anything wrong, except the swifts won't return there. There's nowhere for them to nest now. So the damage is done. And unless the repair work that they do leaves those gaps and those entry points for those swifts, the swifts can never nest there again. So and a big, there could be a big colony in that. So um, my boss and I, a few summers ago, went on holidays on the same week in the summer and there was a big swift colony in the building next door to us and we both left for a week and we came back the roof had been totally um changed so they stripped the old roof and put a new roof on and the builders had no idea there was swifts in that roof and it was 15 swift nest lots so it can happen really really quickly it's it's frightening it can happen this uh, picture down the bottom left is a bumper of a car covered in flies and insects and back when I was year age, when you drive anywhere, you could drive a mile on a summer's night and the car would be covered in dead insects. Because there's so many insects out in the sort of countryside and on the roads and they'd be attracted to light of the car and they get squished. But now you just don't see that same amount of insects because the environment has uh, declined to such a rate that the insects are under pressure too and their numbers are declining. And swifts are insectivorous, so they need insects. They need loads and loads of insects to feed themselves and feed their youngsters in the nest, the chicks. And it's not that swifts are, are sort of falling out of the sky hungry with empty bellies. What's happening is over time they're fledging. They, they don't have as many chicks because what they won't do is lay eggs if they don't think there's enough food in the countryside for them to, to, to get those chicks uh, to fledge and to get back to Africa and, and to survive. So they're not going to take that risk. It's like your parents having 10 kids instead of two and, and everyone having just like, you know, everyone having to share one sausage or whatever for dinner it just wouldn't be sustainable so it's better to, for them to have two chicks than guarantee that can sort of get them away and successful in life than to have 10 that they just can't feed so the amount of insects uh, food out there is really, really important too and climate change and lots of other environmental pressures are affecting that as well you have heard some of the obviously are in the green schools you'll have heard of the all ireland pollinator plan and all those they're really proactive and positive measures we can do to help insects and in turn help our insectivorous birds and other species as well. So that's really good. And then the last picture is a church and church was getting a new roof, but the Swiss weren't actually affected by the work directly. But what they couldn't access was their nest sites because of this hoarding and the scaffolding that was up to allow the builders uh, to get up to the walls to fix them. So and the Swiss just couldn't get into their nest sites. Now the following year they did return, but it's just not good practice and it, it is risky and it means they've missed an entire breeding season because they only have one nest of eggs a year. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's further difficulty for them. So climate change is difficult because when they're on migration, 
and they can get mixed up in these storms because the, the weather now is less predictable. It's less predictable for us as humans, and we're super clever and we can you know forecast the weather and all that. But they're 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 relying on environmental cues to give them the sort of go ahead to sort of fly north or fly south on migration. So they just have to chance it. And if they get sort of they're crossing the sea from from North Africa up into Spain before they come up into Ireland and all that, they hit a big storm. It can be wipe out for hundreds and thousands of them. So it, those storms are becoming more frequent because of climate change and all that. So they're really, really up against. So they're not without friends and a lot of people are working um, to help SWIFT. So at Birdwatch Ireland, I worked for for 10 years. They're doing a lot of work at Northern Ireland SWIFT Group, uh, SWIFT Conservation Ireland, uh, Tidy Towns are doing a lot of work. Uh, through the green schools, there's been schools doing a lot of work, the RSVV in Northern Ireland and Dublin Swift Conservation Group. So there are piles of people realise that Swifts need our help uh, and they're, they're really sort of putting their shoulder to the wheel and, and trying to help. So what can we do? There's a range of things we can do and especially making space for Swifts is really one of the most important things. It's making sure they have a nesting space and then looking after the wider environment and doing the pollinator plant stuff and everything to make sure they have enough food. Uh, and, and just generally looking after the environment, that would be good for Swifts. So here is um, just this is Trinity College, the library in Trinity in Dublin. Some of you might end up studying there someday. And what happened there was there is swifts nesting in the uh, under the scaffolding here along these row of, 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 of sort of um, nice ornate plaster work. And they, they can get in gaps in there and nest. But they went in to fix the builders cam and put up all the scaffolding to fix the roof. Uh, and it actually turned out that they blocked they were blocking the Swiss from getting in. So a guy there, Jamie, that's a student there, PhD student there, he realized the mistake that was being made. And he brought it to the attention of the college who managed to, to convince the builders to put this bridge over the area of where the, where the Swiss were to allow the Swiss access. So he managed to save that colony by just having a conversation with the management in, in the university and OK, it wasn't ideal. It probably cost uh, someone a lot of money to, to do that, but it kept the Swiss there. And those Swiss may have been nesting there for hundreds of years. So, uh, you know, it was a really important intervention he made. So this is just a quick video. I hope it works for you to see the Swiss entering. They're very, very fast. They enter the nest site at 80 kilometers an hour. They approach it at 80 kilometers an hour. So keep an eye for the Swiss. All right, sorry, go back. See him there? Say it again. It just comes in right at the start of the video. You got them. That's how quickly it happens. So if you don't catch it, it can be very, very difficult to identify swift nest sites because they come and go at such a speed. They, 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 and again, they're gone then for a few hours to gather up that big bowl of food before they come back for the chicks. So you've only got a couple of seconds to spot them or they're gone for a few hours. It can be difficult to survey. So swift boxes are a really good way of providing um, uh, nest places for swifts. So you can see the big pile. There's loads and loads of different designs uh, used in different sort of contexts and different places. And, um, you know, so there's a row there. The bottom left photo is a row of single nest sites all together. And I spoke about their colonial. So they like to be where other swifts are. So if we put up one box, we generally put up a number of boxes. So they'll all move into this colony, like a little apartment block for swifts. And they really like that. This one on the bottom right is a triple cavity box. So it's a single box, but in there are three individual little apartments. Uh, and, and the swifts like that. And that's fixed to a, a concrete wall of a house. It could be a school. It could be a gym. It could be anything and it could be an office block. So it's really uh, unimportant what the building is, but they need to be high up uh, and they need to have good access. So if there's no flagpoles or wires hanging down or trees or anything because they fly at such speed, they need to have good clearance to come and go from the building. So here's Kilishandra, the Wild Bunch, a school in, in, in Cavan. And they have a, a nature group that helps sort of, uh, you know, wildlife and biodiversity in their school and in their area. And these two guys, they're doing a survey for their swifts uh, locally and they put up these boxes at the bottom left you can see two single cavity boxes and they have a little speaker here and the speaker is important because if swifts aren't aware that the nest box exists they won't know that they can move in there so you can play the swift call and um, to attract them because they go oh yeah there's swifts nesting down there i'll go check it out because i like hanging out with swifts uh, and they check it out and then they realize that there's a vacant box for them perfectly designed for them and they'll move in hopefully and that's something schools can get involved in and there's many examples of schools that have um, swift boxes up and swift bricks in new schools uh, to, to help swifts move in and give them good safe homes for life. So that's really, really good from the guy, the Kilachandra NS. This is a really nice story. Anyone that's been watching the Eurovision last week, any Eurovision fans, you might want to admit it, but uh, it's, 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 it's in a number of years ago, it was in Baku in Azerbaijan. And there's this heritage site across here. It's called Maiden Tower. But because it's such um, a big crowd festival to host for a city, they wanted to make the city look as nice as they could. 
So they wanted to do up this building, if you like, renovate it. So when all the, the, the tourists came from all around the world to watch Eurovision, that it looked its best and, you know, to put the best foot forward. So they wanted to, to do it up. But the Swift people in Azerbaijan were concerned because they were afraid it was going to affect the Swifts in the building because there was hundreds of Swiftness in that old tower. So they came to the agreement that they would allow them to do the renovation work on the Swift Tower, but they had to mitigate. So they had to replace the nest sites that might be lost and tampered with somehow in um, some other way. So you see this apartment block on the right hand side. You've got this sort of strange silhouettes of the Swifts here, the three Swifts on one wall. And what is that? that is a couple of hundred Swift boxes um, installed in the shape of three Swifts. So it's an artwork and it's also very, very active conservation. So the Swifts and um, move some of the swifts that were, were out of this building and um, went into the, the, the apartment block. That's nearly literally across the road. And it's, it's an ugly old building um, and it's it's much more sort of a, a lot of added value there. And they managed to save swifts. So everyone was happy. And now that occupied and Baku Tower is fully occupied as well. So they've actually managed to increase the swifts in, in Azerbaijan. This is MIT in Castle Bar, and this used to be an old hospital, and it's now it's now a, a college campus. And again, some of you guys might end up studying there in the future. And there's a lady there, Linda Huxley, who is Swift Conservation Ireland, and she works there. And she knew there, was, there used to be Swifts in that building, but when they done it up to to uh, for it to become a college, a university, um, they, they 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 sort of built the Swifts out of the new roof. So to to to, to sort of undo that, she put up these Swift apartment blocks, these triple cavity boxes. For the Swifts, you can see them. There's a number of them there to allow for the colony to expand, um, and you've got those triple cavity boxes. So there's lots of lots of space available there for the Swifts. And you can see some wires coming out of one of the boxes and in the middle, and that's because some of the nest boxes have um, nest cameras. And you can you can go and see those live nest cameras. And there's the a female uh, Swift on her eggs in the nest a couple of years ago. And I just took a screenshot of the same nest this morning. So there is the same female back a couple of years later, and she's just preening there and she's on eggs. So hopefully she'll have two. Uh, swift hatchlings in the next couple of weeks uh, and you can tune into that anytime with your teacher and watch it on your 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 whiteboard in school and you just see the, the link there if teachers want to take notes just even if you just google swift ca swift cameras uh, mayo or anything like that uh, swift conservation swift cameras uh, anything like that you'll find it and, and 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 it's a useful useful thing and it's a really nice thing to watch you just stream the various videos from the various so there's also a very clever thing called Swift bricks, and they're built into the wall. So if your dad's a block layer or your mom or whoever, they can literally just pick up this block, this Swift brick, and put it into the wall of the building. And it just sits there permanently for life. And it's a really good way. And architects and designers and engineers love these because it doesn't take from the look of the building or it doesn't sort of, you know, stick out or out from the building. It's built right into the cavity uh, of the building. It's really, really clever. Um, and I'll show you some examples. For the, here's GMIT in Castle Bar. And you'll a lot about of examples in Mayo because Swift Conservation Ireland is Linda Huxley and it's ba she's based in Mayo. So an awful lot of work has been done in Mayo. And here, this top these top two photos are the, is the the leisure centre, uh, the pool in Castle Bar. Some of you might be familiar with it. And this guy, the builder, is putting in this Swift brick, this triple cavity box in that wall. And then that's before, if you like. And on the left hand side is after. So you can just see the holes remaining on the outside. And a Swift about to enter. So. The building is lovely and modern and well kept, but the, 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 and the swift bricks are just installed there. So it's, it works for everyone. It's cool. but then Port Leash Library, they've just redesigned the new, the new Port Leash Library and they've put swift bricks in there as well. You see the two builders here on the uh, posing beside the, the swift, the, 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 the wall of, of swift bricks too. And there's me with the county librarian just sort of uh, promoting swifts as well. So it's important that we tell people what we do as well to spread the word uh, of, of about these things because if people don't know what you're doing, they don't want to get involved and there's no support for these things. So you have to go on about it a bit and tell people and be proud of what you've done. And that's really important as well for, for any of you under your green schools flags, all of the flags, be it travel or bite or whatever. It's all very important that you brag about it because it's great stuff you're doing. This so is- to interrupt you there, Ricky, just to say, yeah. Uh, Coming up to time now. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a That's grand. Don't mind that. This is another example. I'm going to show you this little video of a very thriving Swift colony in, in, in Leitrim. Or, sorry, excuse me, Russ Common. You see the Swifts there? That's Swifts coming and going, and they're they are um they're dropping in and out of that building so you got swift boxes there as well but they were added afterwards but there's a really really thriving swift uh, uh 
colony in that building and then they added boxes to give more space for the swift so that's really really good stuff um and it's great to see them and that's an old building you can see that there's sort of a pattern emerging here so old buildings suit them better because they haven't been they were designed that way that uh, there was just gaps and crevices and they're old so they, they're a bit they need a bit of maintenance so the swiss sort of getting on those opportunities on the nest there so but your school is probably much more modern than that so it need boxes or bricks to support swiss so here's another idea just to go away from from bricks and, and boxes this is the mural a mural a swift mural in mount Melek where i'm from and it's on the side of a pub on the gable of a pub on the left hand side you can see that but in here to the left is is mount Melek community school it's a secondary school in the middle of town and and um, the school were involved in this project as well and a brilliant swift or a brilliant mural artist called james Kerwin from dublin he painted this beautiful swift mural and that's it that's because mount Melek is a very good town for swifts and we wanted to celebrate that and we wanted to bring raise awareness for SWIFTs and, and the pressure they're under. So you can do, it's not just sort of physical actions, you can also promote what you're doing and, and, and let people know and raise that awareness for the stuff. So you know how important that all is. So if you've got SWIFTs in your area, you can record them with the National Biodiversity Data Center, a uh, really, really important thing to do. So we know where they are, so we can protect them. So there's a special portal online. Uh, if you Google record SWIFTs or, or, or whatever, a biodiversity data center you'll find this and, and and you can record all your biodiversity in the school or, or in your town or village or whatever or your garden so it's really important that we do that so we can we know what's where and we can protect it so that's just the, the screenshot of the portal and uh, it's a really good project if you're trying to do new actions for your for your biodiversity green flag and there's lots and lots of guidance out there so a saving swifts guide is by birdwatch ireland and that's really really uh, easy to use hands-on practical um guidance for, for schools, for everyone. Really, If you pick that up, you get, learn everything you need to know about SWIFTs and SWIFT conservation and projects that you can do and loads of case studies in there and stuff. So that might be one to look up. And that's freely available online as well if you Google just saving SWIFT guide or anything. And SWIFT Conservation Ireland have a pile of guidance as well on their website. So really good stuff. So I've got time for that. Also, I, I do a podcast called In Your Nature. You might like it and there is a SWIFT episode there. So might be sometime you're doing art in class or something like that, something practical, and you can play it in the background and just listen to the facts about SWIFTs and stuff. That might be nice. Or, or, or the other wildlife we talk about as well. So um, you can Google that and you'll find that easy, easy enough. And then that's it. Thanks very much. And thanks for the invite, Claire. And thanks to everyone for showing up and listening about SWIFTs. And if you've got any questions, I'm sure Claire will um, pass them on in the next while. That was brilliant. Thanks a million for that, Ricky. Um really enjoyed it. I have tons of questions myself, but I'll let the schools ask them themselves afterwards. Um, so we'll hand over now um, to, to Hannah. Um, and after Hannah's presentation, there will be time for a Q&A for, for both. Um, so over to you now, Hannah. Um, that was amazing. I was so intrigued by the Swifts. Was everyone else? I hope so too. Um, I, I was too enthralled. I forgot I had to talk at all. Um, so my name's Hannah, Hannah Kindrigan, and I I work as a community development officer in County Limerick. I don't think we have any Limerick schools. I wasn't seeing them in the chat box, but anyway. And I also um, I'm a climate ambassador with Antashka um, as part of their um, environmental education unit. So you're probably asking me what does that entail? If I can turn on. Whoop. Of course, now it won't work. One second now. Sorry, my screen's frozen. Oh, there we go. So a climate ambassador, it, it's a program run by Antashka and it started as an initiative, I said, by the education unit of Antashka with the support of Environment, Climate and Communications Department. The program supports individuals to become climate activists within their community and to promote positive climate actions in a local context. So a big part of it is it's a volunteer voluntary role and um, what I do is I as part of my job as well I work with community groups so what I try to do is highlight what initiatives they are taking and things they're doing to support and um, combat climate change. So what is climate change? Climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. Such shifts can be natural due to change in the sun's activity or large volcanic eruptions. However, since the kind of 1800s so the industry and the industrial revolution, human activities have been the main driver, uh, primarily due to the excessive burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, uh, coal oil, and gas. Uh, burning fossil fuels generates a greenhouse gas um, kind of effect and that acts as a blanket that wraps around the earth trapping in the sun's heat and raising temperatures the main greenhouse gases are caused by climate change in due, in, 
include carbon dioxide and methane. So clearing land, cutting down forests, um, cutting down trees also can release carbon dioxide. Um, also, any activities such as agriculture that kind of uses, again, the machinery that might be used for the burning of fossil fuels and the emissions of methane gas um, contribute, again, to that greenhouse effect. So any kind of large industries really um, affect, have a knock-on effect into that. So just to so I kind of look at the graphics of greenhouse effect. So the sun passes through the atmosphere and the atmosphere is, um, it's kind of like a blanket around the earth. It's made up of a variety of gases. And basically what happens is sometimes it filters a bit of the sun's energy. So it protects us in a way. Um, and it also, next one, so you can see it here. So it allows some of it to bounce back and some of it then is retained within the atmosphere to keep us. So at nighttime, when the sun's not shining, we're all not frozen. You know, there's no big ice sheet when you come out outside. So some, what happens with the greenhouse effect is that blanket is getting thicker. The gases are contributing, making that atmosphere thicker and thicker. And then what happens is it's retaining too much of the energy and heat. So the earth is warming, so global warming. This affects other cycles, such as the water cycle. So for instance, um, if we look at precipitation, so it rains down on the mountains. I think, I think you all know this about school. We, we all did it, I think, in primary level. But so it rains, which comes into groundwater or rivers, and then the evaporation process in the ocean. But what's happening is if the earth is warming, the ice is beginning to melt, especially in, in Antarctica and other areas. So the sea levels are rising. So that's more and more water. There's more evaporation happening as well in certain areas. So there's more likelihood of droughts, which then is um, cre creating flooding issues or droughts. So it's leading to more extreme weather events as well. So here's a picture of Galway back in 2018, one of the worst storms to hit the city. And you can see there, that's one of the main streets and it's flooded all the way up and that's damaged many businesses, homes. Um, and these events are becoming more and more common. You probably remember in the winter times now we have very bad storms, red warnings, orange warnings. Another system it's affecting is the carbon cycle. So as you can see here, this is a bit complicated, but, um, CO2 in the atmosphere, it's uh, the ocean acts as a carbon sink as well. But it's as that ocean, the salt is beginning, basically, we are having issues with it where the sea levels are rising. So there's more flooding happening. And we're also the, the ocean's actually diluting. So it's not as actually good in relation to the CO2 absorption. Um, plants and animals as well are getting affected. So in order to keep up with the demand of food for us all to eat, save now if you want to eat your sweet peppers in the evening with your stir fries, or you want to eat something exotic, a lot of that has to, we have to keep up with demand. So it's, it's about clearing land for agricultural use. So it's about balancing that out looking forward because that does, ha has a place in our, the plants and trees particularly have a place in our ecosystems and carbon cycles. Um, so by getting rid of them to keep up with food demand or other demands on land can affect how our absorption of CO2 works overall. So small things we can all do. Well, one is reducing your carbon footprint. So uh, that means it's about, a lot of it is about thinking about how, what, what can I do? Little things, for instance, rather than maybe getting, buying a bottle of water in the shop, maybe we can keep a reusable bottle of water and refill that. Um, what are we doing at our lifestyles? So for instance, I mightn't travel up to Dublin every weekend to go shopping um, because maybe I have clothes at home or I have a local shop I can support. And that way I'm not also using the car unnecessarily. Reducing fossil fuel. So yeah, we're, we can go to school. Maybe we can set up a cycle group, a walk group um, rather than using the car every morning. Turning off lights, turning off the computers in their classrooms, using energy saving light bulbs, so LED lights compared to uh, halogens, and um, using less plastic, as I said. Reducing food, food waste, so make sure you finish your dinners. Um, that's a big thing. <laughs> 
so we're not snacking later on. Um, food waste contributes so much to CO2 emissions and other emissions. So it is very important when we have food to appreciate it. Um, and conserving water, turn off the taps when we're brushing our teeth. We don't need to be have it running the whole time. Take showers instead of baths. Um, use water vessels to collect rainwater. So that's really good for gardening. So instead of running the tap every time, we can have, it rains so much in Ireland, we could all be collecting water to water the plants and run washing machines on colder settings. So this is a really good graph and it's showing basically how long it takes for certain products to break down if they ended up in water. So you can see there a plastic bottle takes 450 years to break down if it ended up in the ocean. That's a very, very long time. So a lot of some of these can be recycled, like aluminium is recycled quite easily, or maybe at the carton only takes three months to um, break down. So maybe it'll be looking at maybe instead of getting a bottle of water, if I need to buy a bottle of water in the shop, maybe there some options now are cartoned water. So they're waxed carton cardboard water you can drink, and it's it's a much better option um, overall. Um, and these rings, you see the plastic beverage holders take 400 years to break down. And what they're also really bad for marine life because fish can get caught in them or other kind of marine life. Um, and that can stop them from eating, can stop them from swimming. So it's really important to be considerate about that. Um, and all of this is highlighting these easy things you buy in the shops. Like we all buy aluminium cans, a can of Coke or a can of Club Orange or 7-Up to really think about it. Maybe I can pick a better option. Maybe when I go home, I can have dilute instead rather than buying the Coke right now. And solutions. So one of the solution is solar. This is um, Sierra Leone in Africa. This is a really good uh, where they're showing us that they're using their solar energy to power their laptops, which was a really cool initiative. Um, and they, they use a local resource. They get a lot of sunlight. Um, they all suffer with a lot of droughts in this area. Um, so they harnessed something that I suppose was almost, um, oh, quite quite a difficult they harness what they had basically the that they have a lot of sunlight throughout the day so they use that to power the laptops rather than trying to plug them into maybe an energy source that uses fossil fuels and to get on plant trees main objective of my <laughs> um talk today trees are one of the best things to combat climate change and they're one of the easiest measures we can all take. We can all plant trees. We, it doesn't take a lot of space for a lot of species to plant a tree, and they're so effective. They absorb greenhouse gases. So remember those gases I was saying about the big blanket around the earth? Uh, trees take in water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air, photosynthesis. So that's a process in which trees get food, um, starts in the chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll's in the leaves, absorbs the energy from the su sunlight. Green plants use the light energy and change the water and carbon dioxide into oxygen. And they actually, so they take in the carbon uh, monoxide oxide and uh, turn it into oxygen and release that back out into the earth. So it's brilliant. Um, and they, then they also use that photosynthesis to turn, to feed themselves. So they actually turn the, the carbon monoxide into nutrients that can feed them and grow. Uh, the plants use the, some of the sugars and store the rest. So they actually can store carbon monoxide as you see big, big forests. So the other measures they do is they prevent flooding. So depending on the tree species and where they are, some trees are adapted that they take in a lot, a lot of water. So they, they actually need to be in a place where maybe that might flood. Um, they reduce city temperatures and they reduce pollution, as I said, through that photosynthesis. And they keep the soil nutrient rich. So particularly, it's really there important to plant your native species in the habitats they're meant to be in. Um, tree roots have a lot of different bacteria in them and they, they kind of work best in the in the environment they're suited for. Um, so for instance, maybe getting a pine from Canada and planting it in the middle of the Bog of Allen in Offaly wouldn't be very good, would it? Because it's not meant for there. Um, so it is really important when you're thinking about planting trees, well, what's native to Ireland? 
And one of the most famous forests, if you ever heard of the rainforest of the Amazon rainforest, around 76 billion tonnes of carbon is stored in the Amazon rainforest. The trees in the Amazon also release 20 billion tonnes of water into the atmosphere per day, playing a critical role in global and regional carbon and water cycles. So it's a huge contributor to the not only the area where the Amazon rainforest is, but actually to the overall the, how the Earth's uh, cycles works as well. Another aspect is to be kind uh, to wildlife and plant to biodiversity in mind. So like those trees, they provide vital habitats to a lot of different species. Um, planting a variety of native species can support ecosystems and support many species, including our pollinator friends. So some of them have flowers, promoting bees and butterflies. Pick up litter. Sometimes that can harm wildlife. Um, be careful with what you leave outside as well, because like all of us, wildlife is very curious. Um, so if they come along and they see your rubbish and it's sitting outside, they're going to want to eat it and it mightn't be very good for them. And take part in initiatives such as No Mow May. So you probably see around the place, there's a lot of places, people not cutting their lawns at the moment. That's because they're taking part in No Mow May to promote the pollinators. And the Irish Garden uh, Bird Survey as well is a great activity you can do at home. This is actually a picture I took of a fox. Um, so this poor little fox is, was on our roadside. He, she was sitting quite happily, but turned out she was a little bit injured. So what we did is we contacted one of the rescue cent wildlife rescue centers so to come along because we knew she wasn't right. And that's a big part too, is really observing nature around you and how we can all help it. And um, she, she was fine. She ended up getting rescued by them and uh, they brought her to the vet. I think she had a mild concussion. And uh, yeah, she was released again. So she was happy out after it. But taking that time to make sure an animal is okay, but doing it safely, that we're not picking up things that maybe the animal might be too happy with. So what other things we can do? Well, we can come, we can all become climate uh, ambassadors for your community. Get out and enjoy nature. That's a huge part of it. We all, you have to go out and observe things, get creative, collect nature, natural materials that you find outdoors around the ground and make kind of maybe crafts with it. Grow your own veg. That's a brilliant one. Um, and that, that, that way you get to really appreciate the food that's on your plate, but also you get a bit of pride. Just like I, I grew those tomatoes or I grew those carrots. Um, at work uh, to help get the next green flag for your school. So I don't, some of them, yeah, might be still in the process. So best of luck. Plant trees, as I said, you can plant a tree anywhere. They're really easy um, kind of plant to grow. And, it, and they're so amazing at how they contribute to the overall climate change. And speak to your family and friends and your local community on reduce, reuse and recycle. So that's a big thing, as I think Ray said it as well, or Ricky, sorry, said it as well. You have to talk about these things. It's not just about doing them, but you have to really advertise them. So what do I mean by reduce, reuse, recycle? Well, maybe reduce. So turning off the taps, like I talked about earlier, uh, fully turning off the TV, computer games. So if there's a red light on, it's still on. It's still taking up electricity. So it's really important to make sure it's fully off. Ask your parents to buy plastic free and with less packaging. So if you go to a shop and there's an option maybe of something being in a paper bag versus something in a plastic bag, maybe look at that. Ask your parents to turn down the heating at home. I'm, I'm very bad for this sometimes. I'm a cold creature myself, so I, I sometimes am. But it may be putting on the jumper and things like that. And walk to school, set up a group. That's very, very important. Um, and it can help your, reduce your carbon foot dramatically if you're not taking a car every day. So reuse, so reusable lunch boxes instead of plastic bags, uh, reusable cups, uh, reju kind of try see about if you could use things. So maybe your egg cartons you use for art class. I know a lot of schools do use that. They use oh, they use recycled materials to do a lot of arts and crafts. That's very important. You can even use them for planting. Help your parents reuse bags. So the shopping bag. Um, swapping clothes, maybe instead of buying new clothes, go look what you have and see if, if you can learn how to mend clothes. Avoid disposable products. Um, again, that's just being conscious. Maybe use, as I said, the carton over the plastic bottle. Maybe if you don't need something, maybe get the multi-pack rather than the single one. Um, and look at reusing books. I love buying secondhand books. Um, so definitely, I would say wherever you can, use secondhand. Um, so recycle. Oops. 
Um, know what is and isn't recyclable in your green bin. Very, very important. Make sure you really look at what you can put in the recycling bin. Find out where your nearest recycling center is. Um, so yeah, there's some of the items you can recycle in your bin. Always rinse out bottles and tins. So make sure they're they're clean and dry before you put them in your bin. Otherwise that can contaminate things if you put something dirty in and it wouldn't be able to be recycled then. Um, set up your own battery recycling initiative. I know a lot of schools do that. So definitely look into kind of the we, um, I think it's called um, battery recycling. Ask your parents to buy products, as I said, using um, paper alternatives rather than plastic. Um, ask your school to buy recycled paper and always print on both sides. Very important. Wherever you can reduce printing, do. Uh, set up a school recycling project to reduce your waste and compost leaves and grass and food waste. So plant, oh, I don't know what happened to my last second last slide there. Um, big anyway, a big one is to plant the trees. Wherever you have a space, trees have a uh, have a space, and they're as I said, they're vitally important not only for um, promoting climate change, but also part of our actual heritage or our environmental heritage. A lot of trees are in danger at the moment with ash dieback and other diseases. So it's really important that wherever we can, we can promote them. Um, and I think anyone can admit wherever there's, if you've ever been caught in a rainy day and you get, end up going under the tree for a bit of shelter, and th that's what animals use them for too. So really do think wherever you can, um, use na plant native trees. And uh, broad-based leaves in particular, like the oak, are very, very good in relation to uh, carbon filtration. So that's my one there. Thank you. That was great, Anna. Thanks a million. Um, loads of really brilliant ideas there. Um, I'm sure some of them our, school, our schools are already doing, but um, there's lots more ideas there for them to get involved in. Um, so we just have a few minutes left, um, but if any of um, the students in your class have any questions that you would like to ask to Ricky um, or Hannah, you can um, pop them um, in the chat box now and um, we will put it to them. Um, there was, um, I think you, you saw the message there, Ricky, but there was a message there from one school who have already put it in. Um, swift box in their school, which is great to hear. Um, would you generally expect to, to have Swifts coming straight in or would there often be a bit of time needed before um, they might find that place? Yeah, so it can take a very long time. Um, but that's why um, I think I mentioned speakers and lures in the, in the uh, presentation. So because they like being around other Swifts, they're quite attracted to the prospect of other Swifts being around. So if you play the lure through a little external speaker um, and uh, back to an amplifier somewhere in the school, it just plays it on loop and you can play it. Um, you know, see, they have a caller, uh, Teresa was saying, um, and it's playing daily. So they've a lot, they, they've increased their chances quite a bit uh, and probably the speed of which the, the, the Swifts will occupy the, the space. So definitely best practice uh, has, has been put in place there. And I suppose the important thing to say about the, the lure is that it needs that you do need a license to play it. And it's not because you're doing any harm. It just falls into a piece of legislation that um, it just protect wildlife, but it, it just, uh, but the, the license is a one page application and it's for free and you can get it for multiple years. So it's sort of a, a, a one-off thing. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. So I would say I recommend playing the lure to get them in. I mean, I've seen boxes up for, for, you know, almost a decade, but I would any swift cause you just don't know what are there. And it's funny because you can find it all, all back to the Congo, spend the winter there, and then come up and find the exact same cracker crevice that they were in for years before. But when they try to find new sites, the young birds that are trying to establish, they just don't do it that well. And um, so it's it's really a lure is a, is a good good way, way around that. Brilliant. Thanks, Ricky. And we've got a couple of questions coming in from um, Miss Galway's fifth class. Um, we want to you first there, Hannah. So they're asking, what are the best types of trees to plant? Yeah, it's it's really important whenever you're where you have to pick your location, but also maybe picking a tree that would suit that location. As I said, some trees would flourish in if the area is prone to flooding, while other ones would actually die back. They wouldn't be able to survive in it. So really doing your research on where your plant is. Uh, for in relation to kind of photosynthesis, oaks are very good, uh, broad-based ones, beech, uh, fast-growing ones like that. But really do, as I said, 
think about where you're planting it um, and that will help you decide where what tree you're going to go for. Um, but as I said, it's always good to go kind of with the more native trees because that's the ones that are more suited overall to our um, climate and soil structure. So maybe if they can see similar trees growing nearby, they'll probably know that they're suitable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good tree. Um, and then we've got a um, couple of questions on swifts. So one question is how big are swifts? And then another school asks, what is the county that is the most populated with swifts? From six across in Kilpool. Well, so um, swifts are about the size of a swallow if that means anything a little bit larger. So they'd fit in your hand, absolutely no problem. So trying to think uh, what's a sort of household item that would be similar to size of a swift. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just they're, they're, they're a small bird, really. Same size as a sparrow, just with longer wings, really. The, the really common small birds you see at your bird feeders, they're about that size, but just built for flight. So they're a bit more slender and, and long winged. Um, so if that answers your question. Um, and then the best county or the county with the most population of Swift is as far as we know and as far as has been surveyed, because we're very, very tricky to 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 survey for the reasons when I said, remember, they go, they dart into their nest site and then they're gone again for hours. So they can be very difficult to. But we uh, we think Tipperary is. Um, but that is based on it being a very big county. Um, and it also has very big towns and some um, some very historic towns and, and a lot of old buildings. So it, it bodes well. And also it's got uh, the likes of, 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 of um, you know, it's got it's got lakes along the Shannon there as well, which is makes it which fertile sort of feeding ground for Swift. So it's perfect. And I suppose for its size, Sligo does really, really well as well. Um, and again, um, lots of fresh water, really good habitats and lakes up that, that way. Uh, and it's big town in Sligo and it's got a town in parts uh, during the recession. So it's kind of perfect. There's a lot of buildings for for for, for Swifts there as well. But um, the cool, I mean, Wicklow does really well. Uh, it does quite well as well. And um, it's it's but it's small and it probably suffers a little bit from its coastal because they don't like to be too exposed as well. So um, I know Sligo is a coastal county, but um, yeah, Wicklow, Wicklow does quite well um, in fairness, too. Brilliant. And then we have another question here asking, are swifts predator or prey? Yeah, so they're mostly they're mostly predator. They're almost at the top of their food chain. And because of their unique ecology, um, their speed, really, the speed of flight, they're the fastest. You hear a lot about peregrine falcons being the fastest bird. Uh, peregrines are the fastest bird, but that's when they're in a stoop, when they're like back in this stoop, to die for pigeons or whatever they're hunting. But in, in, in horizontal flight, so in powered flight, where they're flapping there and themselves, swift sort of fast. So for, for a bird prey like a sparrowhawk or, or, or a peregrine falcon, they just don't bother with them. They're just too small a piece of food to bother trying to chase that you're probably not going to get. They're going to win that race. So um, I suppose if we had to pick one, certainly predator. And only if you're a fly, you need to be afraid of them. But uh, yeah, if you're a fly, they're definitely a predator. Well. Um, and another question here, how old are swifts when they leave um, their parents? It's from Beth in School Road, Namara. And she's in Can. And then Freddie in the same class or in fourth class asked, can we make our own swift boxes um, or should we buy them? Yeah, so really good questions from, from Beth and, and, and Frida. The, um, so, can, so how old are Swift? So Swifts are only literally six weeks old when they do when they leave the nest. And um, so they have to they do this funny thing. If you watch those nest cameras, uh, and I know Claire shared the, the link there to nest cameras for up the chat. So in the, they're very, they're not even hatched yet. So they're very late arrivers. They don't arrive till May, um, and they they leave. They're gone again by mid August. So they have to uh, lay the eggs, incubate the eggs, hatch the eggs, feed the chicks in all that period. So they're very very short season because they're only, they only have one single brew, but the chicks do this thing, they do press-ups with their wings because they don't get to practice when they fly because if you're dropping out of a castle way up high, you know, sometimes a couple of hundred feet from the nest, you only have one chance. And if you hit the ground, that's it, it's over. So they, they do these press-ups with their wings to, to develop the, 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 the muscles that it takes for flight. And you'll see them later on in the season, sort of towards the, the middle of July and, and towards the end of July, doing these press-ups to develop that. And once they're gone, they're gone. So... And they're, they're, they're three years old before they're old enough to breed and, 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 and raise a family themselves. So that's 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 that answer. And then, Rita, the 
is that you can make your own or buy them. So they're commercially available. There are an awful lot of designs commercially available. And um, But also if you have help, if you have a good caretaker uh, or someone in the family or in the school that's a good carpenter that can help you out, there's designs. And I can share my screen again and show you um, in that Saving Swifts guide, um, there is a nest box design. This is the uh, this is called the the, the Zeist box. Very very well tested box um, and easy to make and don't need a lot of timber and you can get a few of those out of one sheet of of plywood. And the thing about wooden boxes is that they only last a certain um, amount of years. So you can buy commercial ones made out of a thing called woodcrete. And concrete's not very environmentally friendly, so we don't promote that. But this is sort of uh, made out of, of wood chippings and concrete mixed together, and it lasts for an awful long time. So in the it, like forever, basically. So in the long run, really, instead of replacing a wooden box every five years with a new wooden box, probably more sustainable to go and get one wood creep box. So um, you've seen those triple cavity boxes I showed you. They're all made out of that substance. Uh, and the bricks are made out of actually concrete because they have to be load bearing um, if they're going to be in a building because the wall has to be safe and not sort of, you know, fall because... Uh, there's a, a, a bird box stuck into it. So, yeah, you can buy them very cheap um, from sort of 30, 40 quid words uh, all the way up, really. And then you can make them probably for, for a fraction of that if you're to do a few. So, yeah, if you've got someone that can help you, I would encourage that for, by all means. Brilliant. And so that you can scroll back, I did put a link in that chat, like Ruby said, to the Birdwatch Guide, which had the the drawing there, which you just showed on screen. So we'll just take one more question. I know we've gone over time. Um, so last que another question from Pill Pill is what is the average lifespan of a Swift? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so 11, 15 years for a small bird are quite long lived. And um, so you can normally, um, the likes of seabirds, which are always much larger, and um, they're quite long lived traditionally. And but the small passerines like your robin in your garden or your blackbird, they only really ever at maximum get two or three years. because They're under a lot of pressure and um, from predators and the weather and everything. But Swiss, for some reason, they do quite well and they can last 13 or 14 years. So when I said they're site faithful, that they come back to the same cracker crevice or nest box that you've provided. You could be providing a family, you know, uh, you know, opportunities to breed for 11, 12, 13 years and then. Uh, one of their offspring or one of their relations or one of their colony members will move in when that pair dies off or doesn't return uh, and, and the, the colony could last forever and, and be self-sustaining. So, yeah, about sort of oh, well over 10 years is, is the answer. Well, maybe that secret to long life is never rest just like the swifts. Never yeah, lie down. <laughs> eat insects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, look, guys, um, we will we will wrap it up there. I know you probably lots of us need to be um, heading off to lunch or on something else. So I just want to say a um, huge thank you to Hannah and Ricky. Um, really interesting presentations. Um, and thanks very much for, for all the great, the great questions. Um, it was brilliant to hear from you. And um, hopefully you've got some ideas um, to help um, Swifts and um, other aspects of nature um, from this. Um, we will have this recording available in the next couple of days if you want to share that with any of the other classes in your school. Um, so thanks again for everyone. Um, hope you're enjoying Biodiversity Week and you're able to get outside um, over the next few days and uh, take in some of this awareness yourselves. Um, so thanks again, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks.